today is Father's Day, of course, and um, um, let me see, see, I don't, well, I guess I have to, TJ, you're not a father yet, so you have a long way to go. Yes, amen. One of the great blessings that the Lord blessed our lives with is our children, of course. I mean, it's, you know, um, they might not always be as they should, but they are ours. They are ours. And um, I have eight of them. Five girls, three boys. And most people know my, have met my five girls, two of my boys. And there's one that very few people have met, that's Brian. And um, children can be strange sometimes, you know. And um, sometimes we have children and we wonder, they do not reflect anything of us. You know, we know they are ours, but somehow they, they don't reflect anything of ourselves. But watch this. They are still ours. They are still ours. They are still ours. They, they don't always behave right. <laughs> they don't always speak right. They don't always do what is right. But I promise you something, though, that you would defend your child against anybody who would seek to do them harm. So let me ask you, if, if we are like that, people want to give you the impression that if you are a child of God and you are not perfect, then somehow God will reject you. Somehow God would do something that you and I wouldn't do for our own kids or to our own kids. How is that possible? How is that possible for people to, to convey that feeling? How is that possible? How is that possible? That's not possible. The Bible says nothing shall separate us from the love of God. So today, listen, it might only be Deacon Newberry and I in here who are fathers who have actually um, birth, um, given um, birth to children. But all of us here this morning are children, and all of us here have a father. And today you and I can say with certainty to our Heavenly Father, Happy Father's Day. Because we know that His love for us knows no boundaries. Heavenly Father will never reject you. He will never reject you. And here's a simple reason. In order for him to reject you, he would have to reject the sacrifice of his son on the cross. Because that was the reason. That was the only thing that made you and I sons and daughters of God. What his son did. Not what you and I did. Uh, and we have said to him, thank you for your sacrifice for my redemption. And Lord, I know that I don't always act right. <laughs> I don't always think right. I don't always. But thank you that you didn't love me because I acted right. I always thought right. You love me simply because you chose to. And for that, I'm grateful. So while it's Father's Day to all the earthly fathers today, all of us here can say Happy Father's Day to our Heavenly Father. Amen. Let's worship Him. Lord, we give you glory today. We give you honor and we give you praise. We thank you for another opportunity. We welcome you in this place. And we thank you for meeting us here, God. You're always here, always available. It's not you that move, we move. But when we come back, you're right there to receive us. And we thank you, God, right now for your anointed power. We, we, we by your authority, we release our spirits today. To praise you, to worship. 
worship you, to honor you, to give you all the glory because it belongs to you. And Father, those that are on their way, bring them safely. Those that are listening over the airwaves, God, let your anointing meet them right where they are. Lord, I thank you now that you're saving souls today. You're healing bodies. We call it forth now. You're restoring us back to you, Lord God. Save, heal, deliver, set free in this place today. And God, we give you the praise right now. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, for what you're doing, what you're about to do, what you've already done. We give you honor and praise. For you are awesome in this place. Our God is awesome. And we magnify and glorify your name. In the name of Jesus, we give you praise. And all that love the Lord say. My God is awesome. He can move mountains. Keep me in the valley. Hide me from the rain. My God is awesome. Heals me when I'm broken. Strength where I've been weakened. Forever He will reign. My God, my God is awesome. He can move mountains. Keep me, Keep me in the valley. Hide me, Hide me from the
your hands in the atmosphere. He's awesome. Oh, he's holy. 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 He's awesome. He's awesome. Yeah, he's awesome. Come on, come on, come on. Deliver up. Deliver up. Deliver up. Deliver up.
Holy Ghost, you're three in one. Three in one. It's working for me, yeah, yeah. It's working for me. And I don't have to 
worry cause it's working for me. It's working for me, it's yeah. It's working for me. It's working for me. It's working for me. And I don't have to worry cause it's working for me. It's working for me, yeah, yeah. It's working for me. working for me. Open up your mouth and sing it. I don't have to worry. I don't have to worry because it's working for me. It's working for me. It's working for me. Whoa, I don't have to worry because I don't have to worry because it's working for me. It's working for me. It's working for me. Bye. 
Do I live, move and have my being? 
I'm nothing without you. 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 Said I'm nothing without you. Nothing without you. Lord, I'm nothing without you. Nothing without you. Lord, I'm nothing without you. Nothing without you. Lord, I'm nothing without you. Nothing without you. Said I'm nothing without you. Nothing without you. Lord, I'm nothing without you. Nothing without you. Lord, I'm nothing without you. Nothing without you. Said I'm nothing without you. Nothing without you. Lord, 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 I'm nothing without you. Nothing without you. Would you turn with me now, please, to the book of Colossians? I think it is um, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, around there. I want us to turn to the second chapter. I'm going to have my sister Frances come and read for us from verse 6 to verse 23. Will you stand for the word of God, please? And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him, and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught, and you will overflow with thankfulness. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of, the wor of this world rather than from Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. When you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. And with him, you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. 
then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us, and it took away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. So don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink or for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbath. For these rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come. And Christ himself is that reality. Don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on pious self-denial or the worship of angels, saying they have had visions about these things. Their sinful minds have made them proud, and they are not connected to Christ, the head of the body. For he holds the whole body together with its joints and ligaments, and it shows as God nourishes it. You have died with Christ, and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. So why do you keep on following the rules of the world such as don't handle, don't taste, don't touch? Such rules are mere human teachings about things that deteriorate us, deteriorate as we use them. These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline, but they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. And I've read Colossians, second chapter, six through the twenty-third verse, twenty-third verse, verses. May God add a hearing to the spirit and hearers of His word. Thank you. Amen. Let's get ready for communion. turned into wine open the eyes of the blind there's no one like you none like you into the darkness you shine out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you Higher 
God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. The passage my sister read this morning is one of my favorite passages to read to remind me of who I am in Christ. But one of the verses that I really, really like is verse 7. And I want you to listen to it carefully because I, I, I hope you didn't overlook what it says. It says, let your root, let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then listen to this. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught. And this is the phrase that I want you to remember. And you will overflow with thankfulness. The thing that signifies, the thing that epitomizes the life of a born-again believer is a life of thankfulness. You cannot reflect on anything about your life after you have come to Christ and you are not grateful. You are not grateful. And this is particularly true when we come to the communion table because the communion table is designed to remind us again and again of that which Christ did on our behalf. On our behalf. He did everything that was necessary in order for you and I to be made right with God. And that was what was important. You know, Jesus went about healing the sick and raising the dead and opening the eyes of the blind. But hear me, the people who he raised from the dead died. Those who were sick, they died. The blind, they died. Those were temporary things. But that which he did on the cross for you and for me, those of us who have received that by faith, that is permanent. The Bible calls that eternal life. That is the thing that causes us to have grateful hearts. So when we come to the communion table, we always come. Not because we're worthy. We come because we are thankful. So be directed by our ushers, please, and come and receive. And go back to your seat and let's eat and drink together in an attitude of thankfulness. Amen. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand and if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us?
I'm resting against. Will you hold it up for me? Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful this morning. Because as we receive this bread, we remember that the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was broken on our behalf. He was broken so that we might be made whole. And Father, as we remember that it was for us, not because we deserve it, but simply because you loved us so much. And so we receive it this morning with thanksgiving, say, saying to you, thank you, Lord. Thank you so much. Let's eat ye all of it. Let's remove the cover from the cup. And let's hold it up together. Father, thank you for the blood of Jesus. Because Lord, when his body was broken, his blood poured forth. And his blood was shed once and for all. And once his blood was shed, it removed from us every stain, every guilt of sin. And therefore, those of us who have put our faith in what he did, receive it this morning with grateful hearts that by your blood we have been made righteous. We have been justified. We have been made right. And so we receive this as we remember that you did it for us in Jesus' name. Let's drink ye all of it. this morning thankful to you Jesus for all you are in us this morning truly he's the hope of glory in my life this morning he's my everything is the song said he's my everything yes. everything nothing missing nothing broken he's my everything and I'm for that this morning I'm grateful to God eternally grateful to God it's time again to come and say Lord thank you with an offering with the offering that God has asked us to bring this morning we come out of obedience this morning we come out of loyalty this morning to say lord thank you for the monies that you have entrusted amen. into my hand that i would bring back amen that you asked of me amen and, and plant it it's a seed our tithes is a seed our offering is a seed everything we give to god is a seed Amen. And we get a harvest out of the seed that we plant. And if we don't plant any seed, we certainly will not get a harvest. But this morning, we are obedient people. We are obedient to God. And I have to be. I don't know about you this morning. I have no choice. I have to be obedient to God this morning because my life depends on him. Amen. Amen. So let's this morning get our tithing and our offering this morning. Amen. I fix it, jug, and I tell you, I have to be the first partaker of the fruit because my pocketbook was so, oh, it was so heavy this morning. I said, oh, yes. Mm -mm. Money for the fix it jug. Amen. Bring that money out those pocketbooks, sister, before you have to go to the doctor with that arm. Amen. Praise the Lord. And bring 10%. The 10% out of every dollar that you earn belongs to the Lord. It is God's. Don't go home with God's money. Amen. And don't go home with a thank you without a giving God the thank you offering and saying, God, I thank you for you are the air that I breathe. You are my life. You are my strength. You are my instruction. I depend on you. So, God, thank you for your faithfulness. Get your tithes and your offering in your hand this morning and come with thanksgiving, not, not begrudging, not saying, oh, God, another time. It's an opportunity to give this morning. 
you in the hands of us. And also, before that, amen. Today is happy Father's Day to all the fathers. Amen. All those that will be fathers, hallelujah. Happy Father's Day, amen. And we, we in this house, we like to bless the set man of this house that God has given to feed us the word. He's given us and we're blessed. Amen. He gives us the word of God. And that's what we need to live by. Amen. So I have my little green bag. So sorry, some of you didn't get to, to um, do the card, but that's okay. He'll read the names on the card and appreciate those. And But greater than the names on the card is the money that's in the card that blesses him. They just had a, a wedding. and uh, Listen, how much money. Much money goes out of, out of the pastor's hand. Don't you worry. I've been a pastor, so I already know. <laughs> Amen. Money that you don't even, don't you have no clue. You don't have an idea how much money go out of their hands into the hands of others. And we bless and We know we can't pay them, but we want to show our pastor this morning that we love you, pastor. We love, sometimes we don't act like we love you, but we do. <laughs> we do. Sometimes we'll know the kids, but we thank you. We love you. Amen. And this morning, say I love you to our pastor with my little green bag this morning. The card is already in here. Amen. And put the love orphan, orphan of love in here. Amen. 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 You're in the hands of ushers. God, that the people have given. Father, we ask blessings, healing. God, every, everything they need, God, be supplied according to your riches and glory this morning. God, multiply these gifts. Multiply that they bring forth much, much more, God, in Jesus' name. And Father, we give you praise. Oh, we give you praise because it's Oh, if had you not given us anything, we wouldn't have anything. So we're thankful this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Before we sing or minister the next song, there's a special presentation from a little one up on the platform.
Hey, Crips. <laughs> so, uh, the men wanted to get together and get you something. Uh, Darius has been planning it for a couple weeks now, and you know he couldn't be here, so he had us record a video for him. If you could bring that up, please. just knew, you know, something like we just clicked right away. And I just thank God for everything you've done and everything you have continued to do for me in my life. You showed me what a man of God is supposed to be and a man, how a man is supposed to be. And I just thank you. And also you've treated me like I was your own son. And I'm just so thankful for you, you know, introducing me into your family and as your son. And, you know, I know I can't be there, but I'm just thankful to be able to call you my father. Whether we're not related in blood, but you treat me just as well if I was just your blood son. And I just want to thank you. Uh, I want to thank all the guys who are there, standing there in front of you. And as I would say, and they would say, well, thank you for being a father figure in our lives. And thank you for showing us how to step up as men, as kingdom men, in the house of family and faith. And we just thank you. And we just want to wish you a happy Father's Day. And also, what you're stalling me, there is more. Love you, Pop. Have a wonderful, fantastic Father's Day. God bless you. So, you already know how I feel about you, Gramps, but to you that don't know, my dad has been in and out of my life my whole life, and I never really had that example. Um, but one thing, well, a couple things that Doc has showed me, not even by him telling me, but just his lifestyle, is how to praise God with all you have and how to treat a woman. Like, have you seen how he treats my grandma? And I see him every day. He takes time to be in his word, takes time to build that relationship with Christ. It's not just what he does here, it's what he does at home. And then he takes time to build that relationship with his wife. And it's such a beautiful thing that until I got older, I didn't see at all. But I moved in with them and I see it every day. And that's what a father is supposed to be, somebody to give you an example of how you're supposed to live. And that's what you've been to me, Doc, and I really appreciate you. Anybody else? Well, um, Doc, I just want to thank you for everything that you've ever done for me. Um, I didn't have a father, so when I came into the boys' choir, you set that example. You set that bar high. For us every day, you taught us that whatever you're going to be that you're, you're becoming every single day, you taught us to strive for excellence. No matter what we've been through, everything that I've ever been through since I met you, you've always been there. Every step of the way, no matter how hard it was, no matter. I just want to thank you for being that father in my life. You taught me how to tie a tie. You taught me a lot of stuff, and I look up to you. I just want to thank you for being that father. Well, Doc, I just want to thank you. Um, you're one of the fathers of many fathers I do have. Um, you spoke a lot without saying a lot. By your actions and the, by the way you carry yourself so when you do speak people hear you and you spoke a lot in my life as far as being a husband 
to my wife. I've watched you, the way you care for Miss Hendricks, the way you take care of her, the way you watch out for her. And I apply that in my marriage and in my life. And because of the teaching that you did without saying a word, I'm married, I've been married going on four years now and I love every minute of it. I just want to say thank you. Um, when Darius first approached us about giving past Apostle a Father's Day gift, I don't think he knew that we all were going to say something. He just said, oh, just one of us stand up there, you know, man, say something. But it's just such a feeling moment that you have to say something. Um, as you can hear, you know, we've all, you know, we haven't had our fathers around like majority growing up. And the moment Apostle Hendrick stepped into our lives, he stayed there. He's stayed there. The Bible says, the Lord will never, never correct me if I'm wrong, <clears throat> never forsake you, never leave you, never forsake you, correct? Yes. Apostle Hendrix, you have set that example. In my life, you never left, never forsaken us. Even in wrongdoing, I appreciate you. Thank you. so blessed by you young men today because normally it would be one of us adults that are older than you that say, can you would you nobody had to inspire you to do that but the Holy Spirit and I applaud you today thank you Clean me up inside. I was 
words. Our Father and our God, we bless you. And we thank you this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, it is your word that we need in order that we might be strengthened, encouraged, and challenged to grow. And so, Lord, I ask that you give your servants great boldness this morning to speak with fearless confidence and that you will enlighten us by your spirit. Help us, Lord, to hear with the ear of the spirit, to understand with spiritual mind, and to be willing, willing, obedient doers of what you would have us to hear and to do this morning. Glorify your name and your name alone, Lord. As I ask this in Jesus' name, amen, amen. I want to speak to us this morning on the topic, the question that God is still asking men where are you? I want to read for a text from the book of Genesis, chapter 3. <clears throat> Starting at verse 9. <clears throat> and it says, And the Lord, the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? Where are you? And Adam answered him and said, I heard your voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked. And so I hid myself. And the Lord God said to him, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? And the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me. And I ate. And I also want to use for a text from the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17 and 18. Therefore, says the Lord, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I'll be a father to you. And you shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. I don't know how many of you remember several years ago, there was a Christian movie out called Courageous. It's one of my favorite movies. It was made by uh, two Christian brothers. It's the same to a Christian brother that gave us fireproof. And I do not recall if you remember that very powerful speech that the main character gave at the end of the movie. And in it, he said something to the effect, he said, in my home, in my home, the decision has already been made. You do not have to ask who will guide my family, because I will. You do not have to ask who is going to teach my son to follow Christ, because I will. You do not have to ask who will accept the responsibility of providing and protecting for my family, because I will. I will ask God to break the chain of destruction pattern in my family history, I will. I will. I will be the one who will pray and will bless my children. I will. I will. I will. And then at the end he says, where are you, fathers? Where are you, fathers, who fear the Lord? Isn't it time for you to rise up? And answer the call that God has given to you and to say, I will. 
I will. And I will. And so today as we celebrate Father's Day, a month ago we celebrated Mother's Day, and at the time I used it as an occasion to speak to us about what was happening with families in this country, in this nation, not only in this nation, but throughout the whole world. And today on Father's Day, as we celebrate Father's Day, I want to say Happy Father's Day to all the fathers, first of all, and express my, my gratitude to, to all the, the people who express your, um, your appreciation and your gratitude for, for who I am as a man and as a father. Um, that um, if there be any praise for anything about my life. All of it has to go to the Lord Jesus Christ because he it is who made the difference. Made the difference. If you knew the story of my life, there is one of three situations that should have happened with my life. I should either have been in prison or be dead or if I'm still alive, I should have about 12 or 15, 16, 20 kids somewhere that I'm not looking after. But by the grace of God, I am who I am today. And he alone deserves any praise. It is he who has made the difference in my life. I am always conscious of this truth, folks, that I have a heavenly father. And there is nothing that I desire more in my life than to honor my Heavenly Father. I want to ask, therefore, of us men, not just fathers. I want to ask us men the very same question that the Lord God asked Adam those many years ago. And I am sure that it is one that he is still asking us men today. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? And he's not just asking this question pertaining to your location. He's not asking you whether or not you're in Fort Pierce or Port St. Lucie or in, in, in Orlando or wherever you may be at this moment. That's not what God is asking you about your location. God is asking you about where you are in various areas of your life. He want to know where you are in your relationship with him. And secondly and most importantly, after his relationship with you, God is asking, where are you in your relationship with your family? Because it's important for us to know that God created fatherhood. When God created fatherhood, God had a very important and God had a very eternal purpose in mind. God's purpose was that we fathers, that we were supposed to reveal and represent him to our families and to those around us. It was us men that God first put his spirit in. God first poured out himself into us. And then he took from us and he made the woman. But when God created man, he wanted us to be the representation of him in this earth. Particularly to our families, to our wives, and to our children. And listen, God didn't just simply realize that us earthly fathers were supposed to be like him. And then he decided to call himself our heavenly father. No, God eternally existed as God the Father in heaven. And he intentionally created the role of fatherhood on earth to reveal who he is. And to show us the nature of his relationship with his son. So if that is the case, let me ask you, where are there such men of God today? Where are the godly men that are revealing their heavenly father in the earth today? Where are they? Where are they? 
and all of us human fathers, we are called to be a daily physical representative of God to our children and to introduce this heavenly father of ours to them so that the next generation will grow up knowing him and be able to pass him on. What should a child see when he looks at you and I as his or her earthly father? What should he see? He should see very much of the qualities of God. He should see exemplified in you and I qualities that shows him and points him or her to the almighty God. He should see somebody who lovingly provides. He should see somebody who is a strong protector of him or her and the family. He should see somebody who is truthful as they leave their house. He should see somebody who is respectful of authority. He should see somebody who is an intimate friend. Because watch this, when a child looks at his father... The child will think that if my earthly father loves me and cares for me, then my heavenly father certainly does love me and cares for me as well. When a child looks at you and I as we reflect our heavenly father, that child will think if my earthly father means what he says, then it means that God Almighty, my heavenly father, means what he says. And if my earthly father would die for me, then it is not difficult for me to believe that God, my heavenly Father, would do the same. So where are the men of God reflecting this to their families today? Because listen to me, it is not so much important to me, and I don't think it's important to God, whether or not the, the community sees you as this, if your family doesn't see you as this. It doesn't matter what kind of image we men have in our community, in our workplace. If our families, if our families do not see it in us, then nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. If our families can see these characteristics, though, being manifested in our lives. If we not only help them to change the way they think about God, but it will help them in their own relationship with God. And they are the ones who will then be able to carry on and pass on to the next generation the image of a heavenly father who cares for them. You will only know God the way you see him manifested in those around you. But if your child, though, sees you as harsh and distant and absent, then what do you think the child will think when you say to him, God is your father? And I do not mean to imply here that we fathers are perfect or have to be perfect. We are far from being like God in so many ways. But it's part of our Christian, it is part of our children's human nature. It is part of our family's human nature to judge God who they cannot see in light of what they see in us, their earthly fathers. You and I are the mirrors that your children is looking at to see what God looks like. I remember in one of my sermons that I asked my sister Jane to, to, to do the PowerPoint for. She, she, she I, I, in it I said something that you, we are not pussy cats. And she put up a picture of a cat looking in the mirror. And guess what was looking back at her? A lion. Oh. 
When a child looks at you, they are seeing a reflection of what they think God looks like. Let me ask you, can you say, can you truly say that this generation knows what true fatherhood really looks like? Can you say that? Can you say that this generation is seen, modeled before them in our popular entertainment, in our popular culture? Can you say, even amongst our leaders, can you say that we are seeing God being modeled before this generation? And the result is that we have now a generation of people, millennial particularly, who are struggling with their understanding of who God is and what he really is like. Survey shows now that a large percentage of so-called millennials, when asked for their uh, religious affiliation, say they, they, uh, they identify themselves as none. None. that the percentage of people, this generation, who are identifying themselves religiously as none, is fast approaching the same percentage of people who identify themselves as born again. And how did they come to this conclusion? A lot of it has to do with what they see or who they see as God in us men who call ourselves fathers. Where are the true men of God today? Can you see them in our leadership? The answer is no. Can you see them even in among our religious leaders? The answer is no. And the sad thing is that they're not able to see him in those we call fathers. In our society today, many men are just simply drifting. They are totally disengaged. And they forget that they have been given the position of leadership in their families. What we see now as norm are men, watch this, who feel it is all right for them to be irresponsible, for them to be immature, for them to be careless, for them to be negligent in their roles as husbands and fathers. And the more that this happens, the more we put our families in moral and spiritual danger. The more that this happens, the more our marriages are being challenged and put at risk. The more we see this happen, the more our children are at risk. And the more we see this happen, the more we see even our own faith are being challenged. God's command to us men as husbands and as fathers is to lovingly lead our homes. As men of God, we are to walk honorably. We are to be people of integrity. We are to be men who embrace our responsibilities. We are to be the chief shepherds of our own families. Because you and I are called to model a loving Christ-like example to our wives and to our children. That was the first priority God gave you and I as men. As men. Hmm. That is God's order. That is how God designed it. And because this is how God designed it, and this is what God has called men to be, are you surprised then that it is any wonder that the godless culture in which you and I live want to mock and constantly undermine fathers and fatherhood? They're constantly attacking and they're constantly seeking to undermine what God designed 
and what God values. Long before the Lord established the church, he established the family. Therefore, hear me, one should think carefully, very carefully, about dividing families. One should think carefully, very carefully, about dragging away children from their parents. One should think carefully and very carefully. The Bible tells us indeed, say, what the Lord has put together, let no man put us under. Hmm. And he's not just talking about the husband and the wife, because children are a blessing from the Lord. And one should think carefully, you will have a high price to pay. A nation will have a high price to pay when they seek to undermine that which God values and that which God designed. And our culture would like us men to think that we do not have the right to lead in our homes. We do not have the right to be responsible. We do not have the right to act like godly men. But hear me, our culture is not our final authority. God and his word is. God and his word is. So we men here this morning, those of you who are here, including myself, we have to ask ourselves some hard and some very revealing questions this morning. And even if some of these questions do not directly relate to you, they will in some form or another. If you are not a father, you are going to be one day. If you are not married, you are going to be one day. So the question that some of us need to ask ourselves is this, is your wife weary? Is she worn out and always feeling like she's carrying too much on her shoulder? In your marriage, does your marriage lack clear direction? Does your marriage lack romance? Does your marriage lack true intimacy? Your own children, the ones that you gave birth to, are they emotionally distant from you? And are they spiritually indifferent towards the Lord God because of you? When it comes to your faith, is your faith anemic and weak at best? Is that who you are this morning? Like countless men... You may be carrying a huge load of regret that seems to be keeping you from being the man you, you truly want to be inside. But hear me, hear me. This is not the time for you and I to be in despair. Because hear me, no man and no family is lost when God gets involved. The reason for our mediocrity in our lives, in our relationship, is because we have excluded the main ingredient. Have you ever had fried chicken with no seasoning? Now, chicken is the most pop perhaps the most popular meat we eat. But watch this, man, in order for us to enjoy that important part of preparing that chicken is the ingredient we put in it. And when we exclude those ingredients, all you end up with is blah. Not only won't you eat it, nobody else will. Nobody else will. And hear me, and since it is God who called you and I to be fathers, it is he who gave us the right to be fathers. Then you and I can rest assured that he will also give you and I the ability. He will also give you and I the empowerment to steer our family in the right direction right back to him. 
The Bible says it is he who works in you both to will and to do. You and I have been called to lead our families. And leadership determines direction. The direction your family goes depends on your leadership. And deep down inside, we all would like to see things change. We all would like to see things turn around from the way they are now. But hear me, the key to the success of any nation, the key to the success of any church, the key to the success of any community depends on how the men respond to God and how they lead their families in those areas, in those areas. How important are fathers? If you want to get to the core of who people really are, just have them start talking about their dad. Let them tell you about their father. Let them tell you how their father treated them. Let them tell you how they, what their father modeled before them. Let them tell you why they are who they are. And if they are truthful, and if they are being transparent, either they will be fighting back tears because they loved and admired their father so much, or because they were so deeply wounded by their fathers in one way or another. I didn't grow up with my father. My father left five of us when I was five years old. I never saw him again until I was 23 years old. I didn't see my mother again until I was 36 years old. And in the meantime, God brought a man into my life. His name was Gordon Mead, an Englishman. And I remember when Mr. Mead would move back to England from Jamaica. I remember the example that this man was to me, both as a Christian and as a dad and as a husband. And this was a man who was passionate about education and all of that. All of those things I adopted from him because my own father couldn't read or write. And then I heard that Mr. Me died. And I cried for days. I was driving to work crying. And watch this. He died in 1984. And to this day, to this day, whenever I think about him, to this day. Here was the man who was my dad. He died at age 64. I am 66. I have lived longer than he did. My biological father died at age 88. My adopted dad died in 1984. My biological father died in 2011. And when people talk to me about my dad, I don't think of my biological father. I think of this white man named Gordon Mead. Thank you, God. Yeah. And a lot of us fathers do not realize the vital role that we have in our family. And when we neglect that vital role, we do not know the things that our children in particular are destined to suffer because of it. Because of it. Because my father left me and us, five of us, we ended up in one orphanage from another where we were abused physically and sexually. And to this day, I wonder what I might have become had God not intervened in my life, in my life, in my life. What would I have become?
Many of our fathers today have lost their purpose. They've lost their sense of direction. This current generation of young men do not know what it means to be a man, much less to be mature men and responsible leaders. Many of our young men today are not prepared to become strong, engaged fathers. Because we live in a society today that encourages boys to remain boys for as long as possible. We live in a society today that I want boys to extend their, their childhood right into their 30s. Yes. While we're forcing our young women and our young girls to become women long before they are ready. Today, instead of growing up and getting married and purposefully and courageously raising the next generation, millions of our young men today are staying single. They are remaining emotionally and directionally attached and dependent on their mothers. While they become addicted to entertainment, while they become addicted to pornography, and while they become addicted to video games. And many of our young men today, they want to have the privileges and the rewards of manhood. But only the responsibility and the moral requirements of boys. And so when they become fathers themselves, they do not know what to do because they are not equipped for the job. And so to our young women are entering life without a deep sense of value and worth. Our young ladies, rather than displaying feminine charm and modesty and grace, many are becoming, if not equally as rude and as unrestrained as the stereotypical guy. And many of our young ladies today are being told to act like and to outdo men as much as possible. And so we find that girls today are aggressive as they flirt. And they are in constant search for acceptance and attention. Things that they had not been freely given to them by the one man in their lives whose love and whose approval they so desperately need, their fathers. And so what these young girls end up doing, and we see it all around us, is that they auction off their priceless virginity for a movie. For some bling bling trinket. And the flattery of some smooth talking con man. Some deceiver. Who as soon as he gets what he wants, he ups and leaves her. Many times to raise a child alone without the father. And these young ladies today are desperately hoping that by being held for a few minutes by some porn addicted teenage boy with raging hormones that they will somehow be able to fill the dark canyon of love. That their disengaged and absent fathers has left aching in their empty heart. And it never happens. It never happens. Where are the godly men? Where are the godly fathers? today? Because more and more kids today are going to bed at night without their fathers in the home. And the absence of father is now considered the most significant family and social problem facing our nation. Because studies after studies show that many prisoners, many of those who are drug, drug users, many of those who drop out of high school, many of those who are runaway, many of those who are rapists, all of them have something in common. The overwhelming majority of them come from homes without a father. Fatherless homes produce more than half of all youth suicide. More than half of those children with behavioral disorder. A child is 20 times more likely to end up in prison if their father is not involved in their lives. A father's physical presence also affects a child's physical health. Those living without their fathers have a higher rate of asthma, depression, headaches, anxiety, and they are significantly more likely to use drugs and become suicidal. And while all of this is happening to our kids and happening to our homes, what are the fathers busy doing? What are these fathers? That, why are these men who fathers these children? What are they busy doing? They tell us that today's men spend more time watching television. 
that these men spend a lot of time surfing the internet and very little time in any meaningful conversation with their own children. And they tell us that even if the children are with them while they are being entertained, that it is the television. It is the television that then becomes the thing that influences the children. And those of you who have lived as long as I have know that the television and the internet are loves of fathers. There was a time when fathers were respected. Movies and television shows depicted fathers as heroic and honorable. Nowadays, look at how fathers are being portrayed. Fathers today are being portrayed as incompetent fools who can be easily outwitted by their wives and their disrespectful kids. Think of Homer Simpson on The Simpsons. And this is the per perverted perception that our popular culture wants us to have of ourselves as men and fathers. And Satan will stop at nothing to attack and undermine and destroy what God has set in place. And Satan has declared all out war against all men. And if you are a husband and a father, you have a target on your back this morning. And the question then for us is what are we going to do about it? Because you would agree with me that it's time for a change. That now more than ever we need men who are determined. We need men who are committed. Men who are committed to what their God-given purpose is for their lives. Men who are determined and committed to their marriages and to their families. Our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father. God, our Heavenly Father, He is the source from which all other things come. And in the Bible, God as Father is the first person of the Trinity. And any time you hear about the Godhead, describe it always as God the Father first, then God the Son, and, and then the Holy Spirit. And Jesus Christ, God's Son, willingly follow the leadership of his Father. If you look and study the life of Jesus Christ, you will discover that he always speaks the word. He always performed the works, and he always carried out the will of his Heavenly Father. And God's Son, Jesus Christ, came to reveal the Father to us. And the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. So when you and I want to see what God looks like, all we need to do is to look at Jesus. Because he represented his Father perfectly. So then how well are we men represented our Heavenly Father? Because that's the reason why you and I were put here. So I'll give him purpose. Hmm. There's no more influential person in a child's life than the child's father. None. Mothers are priceless. Mothers are irreplaceable. Mothers are needed beyond measure. But mothers were never designed to be men or to fill the role of fathers. The Bible says the glory of children is their father. And in saying that, it is revealing an important dynamic of how God wired the hearts and the minds of our children. The glory of the children is their father. And why is that? Because children learn their identity from us fathers. When children are young, they do not know who they are. They do not know what is right and what is wrong. They don't know who God is. They do not know how to live their lives. And they will naturally go to their fathers for answer to the biggest questions that they will face. Like, who am I? Who is God? Am I loved? Do I have what he say? What is my purpose in life? Those are the questions that a father is supposed to be answering. And if the father do not teach their children these, the answer to these questions, the truth about these things, then the child will learn them from the world and what the world teaches about these things are all lies. A child learns their identity from us. A child learns their value from us. They watch their fathers to find out what is important. And it is part of our job as fathers to keep our children from learning 
the lessons of life the hard way. It is our wise words. It is our wise actions that constantly reinforce for our children those things that are of the highest priorities. It is our words. It is our wise words and our wise action that teaches our children the deeper truths of life. And so if we are not there, or if we are there but we are not intentionally engaged, then all that will happen is that our children will walk through the most important period of their lives. And our children will face the most important decisions they will face without the one person. The one person who should be carefully and lovingly leading them the most. And if we are absent and if we are not engaged and we're in the name of God, how do you expect them to know what to do? And the world has its own perverted version of manhood. And that's what our children will gravitate to. Why do you think we have gangs in this community? It's because boys are looking for something to join. People used to refer to the boys choir as we were like a gang. And, and, and in a way we were. And I watched, listen, I watched those young men. I watch them transform, many of them, become positive. And today, many of them are sitting here. Today, I see Peanut is here visiting with us today. From time to time, they come back, and I look at them with pride. These are young men making something of their lives, positive. It's good to have you here, Peanut. Our children learn their identity from us. They learn their values from us. And they learn their worth from us. When a father says to her child, to his child, I love you, I'm proud of you. When a father says to his child, I am always going to be there with you. I'm always going to be there with you. I'm always going to be there with you. I'll never leave you. That assurance changes the life of a child forever. Ah. Because... Studies show that children do absolutely better in school. They develop better social skills. They are less likely to exhibit criminal behavior when their fathers are involved. And when our young girls in particular look in the mirror, she needs to hear the reassuring voice of her dad echoing in her ears and in her heart, reminding her that she's beautiful and that she is loved. And any young girl who knows that she's beautiful and she's loved, that young girl is less likely to have a problem with her identity. She's less likely to become sexually promiscuous. She's less likely to become a mother out of wedlock. And sadly, this is not the case for far too many families today. And so we need to rediscover again God's original intention of what our home should be like. Home should be a place of peace and purpose. Should be a haven of love and enjoyment. And great homes do not just happen. They are intentional. They are gardens in which love are intentionally planted. Their gardens in which commitment are intentionally planted. Their gardens in which leadership are intentionally planted by us men. And like all gardens, they need to be intentionally cultivated. They need to be cultivated intentionally. They need to be intentionally watered. They need to be intentionally guarded. At my house, it's rare that I fall asleep before my wife or my kids. But if I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, one of the absolute first thing I do, I get up. I make sure that all of my doors are closed. My windows are secured. I make sure that the garage door is down. 
and I make sure that my gun is within reach. So even if my wife or, or my grandson or my daughter should have done all of that, I do not assume it. It is still my responsibility. It is, and it must be done deliberately. And a man must let truth and love and wise discipline become the constant part of who he is as a father and as a husband. He should carefully nurture his wife he should carefully nurture his children. He should carefully nurture his own attitude so that in his home, his home will be a place where his marriage and his kids will grow up and behave and thrive. His home will be a place of peace and love. We set the tone, men, we set the tone. We set the tone. The greatest compliment my children ever paid to me is when they said something to me about the way they see me treat their mother or their grandmother. That's the greatest compliment. Because a lot of time, people don't see the way you act behind closed doors. See? And that is why I'm that is what I'm calling us men here this morning back to. To a life-changing commitment. To a new resolve this morning. Because hear me, God commands that. The time that you and I are living in calls for that. And our children and our wives deserve that. So where are you men of God this morning? Our generation desperately needs committed and courageous men to stand up. We need men who will not be swayed by the culture. We need men who are not afraid of criticism. We need men who are resolute about leading their families no matter what. We need men who will, not, who will lead their hearts and not be led by their hearts. We need men who will teach sexual purity to their sons and their daughters so that more children won't enter the world without being married. We need men to stick to their marital vows and cry out to God for help to love their wives rather than give up during difficult times. We need men who will refuse to sacrifice their families on the altar of a promotion and a paycheck. We need men who will refuse to let entertainment eat up all of their time and, and deaden their consciences. We need men who will speak up and speak out against those things that are destroying our culture and our families. And we need men also who will be quick to forgive their own fathers who did them wrong so that they can break the chain of the past and begin to set new standards. We need men who will stand with their pastor and pray with their pastor. We need men who will pray with their pastor for revival in our churches. And we need men who will work with their pastor to strengthen their fellowship. And so the question is, if you're here this morning, are you such a man here today? And my prayer is, oh Lord God Almighty, give us such men we need these kind of men. We need these kind of men. Because hear me, hear me. When strong, committed, God-fearing men come together and work together, there is absolutely nothing that we cannot accomplish for our families. There is nothing that we cannot accomplish for our church. And there is nothing we cannot accomplish for our community. But it takes God-fearing, committed men. Because here's the thing, we, God-fearing, committed man, we always bear in mind this one immovable, unconditional truth that we have a Heavenly Father who is for us. And we are never alone. We are never alone. We know if we are committed men of God, 
that our Heavenly Father loves us unconditionally. That no matter what you and I face, that together with our Heavenly Father, you, He and I, and you and Him becomes a majority. And you know and we know that the battle is always His. And He has never lost a battle and He will never lose one. And you and I know if we are committed men of God that He is always for us. And it doesn't matter who or what is against us. And he has put you and I here on this earth in times like these. Particularly in times like these to represent his son Jesus Christ. Yes. To our sons and to our daughters. And to our nation. We're here to boldly speak the words. We're here to forcefully work the works. And carry out the will of our Heavenly Father. Because regardless of what our culture says, regardless of what other men do, you and I must be bold and courageous to lead our families for the sake of the one whom we represent. And for the sake of the next generation who will come after us. You and I must be God-fearing, committed men Men of resolve who will boldly proclaim in the words of Joshua that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Because if God is for us, who, again, who can be against us? And so I end with the question I began with. Where are you, men of God? Where are you fathers who fear the Lord? Where are you men who is ready to stand up and answer the call of God on your life and say with determination and resolve, I will, I will, I will. If you're here this morning and you're a man of God, and that is your resolve, will you stand on your feet with me, please? In the name of Jesus. All I want are our men. Listen, men, you men know me enough to know that it is not my desire to embarrass any of us men. That's not what, listen, we are the image of the almighty God. You and I are the carriers of his spirit in this earth. The greatest honor you and I have is that. It's not the titles you and I carry. It's not the money you and I make. It's not the position you and I have. The most important thing about you and I is that we are called to be carriers of the spirit of the almighty God. And you and I are called to carry it proudly. Yes. You and I are called to carry it with honor and with integrity. That's what I'm asking of you this morning. That knowing that that's what God has called us to be. Will you pledge with me that that is what you will do? Listen. Everything starts with a decision. And it is your decision. So I'm going to ask my men to come up here. I'm going to pray for us. Pray for you men. All of our men. Including, I don't want any music at the moment unless my wife wants to play. But I want our men up here, please. I want to pray for our men this morning. How many fathers do we have here this morning? Amen. Amen. How many fathers do we have to be? Raise your hand, all of you who are not fathers yet. Yes, absolutely. Okay, KJ, did you raise your hand? Put, <laughs> do you want me to come over there and raise them for you, KJ? Listen. Man, listen. The love that I have for you men here 
is nothing compared to the love your heavenly father has for you. And the Bible tells us that he sings over us with joy. He sings over you with joy this morning. That's amazing. That's amazing. That's amazing. Will you bow your heads with me, please? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, I declare that these men standing here this morning are resolute, determined, committed men of God in whom the Spirit of God lives and reigns. I declare that you shall be the representation of him first of all in your homes to your wives and to your children I declare that you shall be the representation of him in your workplace at your job and I declare that in your life men and women everywhere will see God manifest through your actions and your words and your attitude and that they will give him glory and I declare that you are blessed to do this because your Heavenly Father is the one who will both will and empower you to do this and I declare it so in the name of Jesus Christ the one who represents our Heavenly Father best to us and because we speak and ask it in his name it shall be done it shall be done in Jesus name amen amen the Lord bless you gentlemen First of all, let me express my gratitude for having you here worshiping with us this morning. Do we have any first time visitors here? Okay. It's nice to have you here. Peanut, good to see you, man. It's always wonderful to see you. Drop in to see us. Amen. I want to make a couple announcements, please. This week, there will be no prayers this week. I'm taking the week off from Friday prayers just to rest. And there will be none Saturday as well. But we'll have Bible study um, on Wednesday. And it's past the pastor night. So please come with your questions. And we will be considering the, f the final two verses from John 3, from verse 16 to verse 19. If there are no questions, we will look at that. So please be here for that. Please remember to be praying for each other. Pastor Vani will be leaving um, soon for St. Thomas and uh, please continue to pray for her and before I pronounce the blessing let me just express publicly to all of you who helped with my um, our daughter's wedding yesterday and especially and especially you Pastor Vani you went beyond <laughs> you went beyond yes. Yes. We will never be able to thank you enough because nobody knows the amount that you did except us. You went way beyond what was called for. You acted very much like a mother. And I appreciate that, that you did that for my daughter, for our daughter. Thank you. Thank you. For all the others who helped her in the kitchen, Sister Sandra and Sister Shea, and from my brother Newberry, and 
who came, stayed here and, and cleaned up yesterday. <laughs> and for Mourinho and Marquise, you guys who um, came and helped. And oh, thank you guys. Thank you. I cannot thank And all the others who, in one way or another, helped with it and made it such a success. It was, um, I hear a lot of people say to me, Pastor, that was, that was one of the most beautiful weddings I've been to. Um, I have a couple of people to come to me and say, Pastor, when, when I'm ready to get married, I want you to do it. By that time, I will have retired, and my wife and I will be <laughs> cruising somewhere in the South Pacific. But thank you. Thank you for all that you did to make yesterday such a meaningful day. They're on their honeymoon, but Darius took the time this morning to text me. And when he comes back, I'm going to ask him, man, when did you have time to, t to text me? But he wanted to say Happy Father's Day. And I really appreciate that. And once again, thank the, the young men, Marquise, Mourinho, baby Huey, and um, um, TJ, for your kind gesture this morning. And, and, um, and you guys are... Yes. Do you know, and, and I'm going to close it, do you know that for all the years I have been a Christian and for all the close friends I have, Dylan is only the second child that I've ever stood up to be a, a godfather for. Only the second one. Because I have always felt that if I could not be intimately involved in the child's life, didn't just want to be, say that I was the godfather. The other one is my brother Chappie's first daughter. And when she was ready to get married a couple years ago, she called her Uncle Earl to come and marry her. And Dylan, Dylan's life is going to be affected for the rest of his life by us. Because we're going to be part of his life. So I really appreciated what you did this morning. Amen. And let me just say thank one more person. Where's Mother Johnson? There she is. Mother Johnson, you do not know how hot I get up here after I speak. You probably see me. And every time I look here, Mother Johnson, I always have my water. Ma'am, I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. I appreciate your love and your service and your heart. Thank you. Thank you so much. And the rest of your family, thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your presence. Let's stand. Let's receive the blessing. Oh, and I want to thank my, my friend over here, KJ. I enjoy your playing, man. You, your playing is so sweet. I really do. Thank you, man. All right, will you raise your hand with me now, please? And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit now rest and abide with you. Listen, you are His people. He is your God. He has blessed you. So walk in his blessing today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give somebody a hug before you leave.